so yeah, in all, both of my uh, finishing pig studies, uh, we did compare our pelleted treatments to mash, uh, just so that way we could get that baseline to see what the pellets were doing, and I guess uh, compared to the conventional way of feeding uh, pigs with that mash feed. And so I guess looking at it, the improvements that you're getting out of pellets, especially with high ingredient prices that we've seen here in the last, what, three or four years, where it's something that we haven't seen in a while, um, you're going to be getting those performance, the, the performance enhancements, and you're going to be able to make that money back in return. And so getting the improved feed efficiency, and in one, in one of my studies, we saw a slight improvement in uh, average daily gain. Hello everyone, I am Wilmer Pacheco, I am the, your host today for this episode of the Fit Science Podcast Show, and uh, I have the pleasure today to um, have um, Patrick Badger, uh, who is a research scientist at Beauregard. Hello Patrick, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Dr. Pacheco, how are you doing? Doing good, uh, Patrick. Um, First, I would like to, you know, thank you for, for joining us in this uh, podcast. I know that we are going to learn a lot uh, today. And, uh, you know, my first question is like, if you could just tell us a little bit more about uh, your um, uh, background experience. Yep. So I'd be happy to. So I grew up in uh, southern Indiana on a small family farm. I uh, grew up showing pigs and cattle in 4-H, and that sparked my interest in the mostly the meat animal industry. And that ended up taking me to Purdue University where I ended up getting my bachelor's in animal sciences and kind of learned along the way, started learning about nutrition and more specifically swine nutrition. And that led me to reaching out to K-State and I had some interest in feed manufacturing and they forwarded me to Dr. Uh, Polk there at K-State in the feed science uh, department. And so that kind of spiraled and here we are. So I went out to K-State and did my master's with Dr. Polk and his uh, feed science team. Excellent. And uh, during your uh, master program, uh, maybe if you could share uh, the the type of research that you did, um, you know, during those two years, I imagine, of, uh, you know, your master program. Be happy to. So I pretty much did a lot of uh, pelleting research. So a uh, majority of it was looking at pellet quality and more specifically pellet quality and the effects on grow finish pigs growth performance and also looked into a little bit of diet formulation and its effects on the subsequent uh, pelleting parameters and pellet uh, mill efficiency and pellet quality due to the, that uh, diet formulation. Excellent. Uh, and uh, when you when you were, uh, you know, making uh, those different diets, did you use uh, any binders? Because, you know, now that you uh, work with Beauregard or, or, or uh, you just produce, you know, like a... Uh, a diet, and then um, then you grind some of those pellets to um, to produce the different uh, levels of fines in the in the finished feed for for your research. So in my first uh, grow finish pellet quality study, um, we we included a Maribond 2x, which is a Borgard product, um, and so we were pelleting those those diets, but we weren't getting enough fines at the feeder that we knew we could really accomplish our uh, treatment uh, assignments. And so we collected all of our pellets, we screened them all, and then we took a, a predetermined amount of those pellets back and we reground those through a single pair of crumble roll and, uh, twice. So that way we could achieve our pellet fines or as close as what we could get to those pellet fines of what you would typically see coming off a pellet mill. Oh, this this is really good. And um, I mean, since you... Um... Uh, since you did that research, uh, could you just, you know, tell us more or less, you know, uh, how does the level of fines affect the, the, the performance of the pigs? And, uh, and if it's like a, if the industry should be looking for an optimum uh, level of whole pellets at the feeder level. Yeah. So to start off, um, I mean, obviously, as your percent fines increase, your feed deficiency is going to decrease. And a lot of times that's, t that's attributed to feed wastage at the feeder. Pigs will go through and they start sorting out those fines. I've actually seen pigs throwing fines out of the feeder, trying to get down to those pellets. I guess to answer your question on the optimal level, I mean, I would say the optimal level is you get 
zero fines if that's possible, which we know it's not, mm -hmm. but trying to minimize those as best you can would be the best strategy going forward. Excellent. Excellent. And, uh, you know, when, when I was in a, in a Smithfield, I re you know, I never worked with pigs, uh, but I always uh, listen to some of the friends who were working at the farms and uh, they say, they always say, well, if the pellet quality is not good, it's really hard to manage. Uh, the, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically the percentage of coverage of the feed in the, in the feeders. Did you see some of those issues when you were doing the research? Yes. And so we have a little bit different system. We had a little bit different system there at K State. Um, we had the feed logic system, so we were able to actually assign what feed is coming out of what bin and how much is going into each individual feeder. Mm -hmm. um, so we were getting able to kind of, I guess, dial in those the amount of fines we would have, and then from there you'd have to go through and tighten down feeders depending on um, what the treatment was, whether it was a low fines diet or a high fines diet, or you're feeding the mash, and so. You had some variation in feeder pan coverage, and you could have anywhere from, you know, I would estimate 50% feed pan coverage, and you might have in excess of it, um, just because of the way the pigs were feeding and how they were feeding at the feeder at that, that growth stage. Okay. Uh, and and uh, as, as you just mentioned, you know, a few minutes ago, you, you, you say, like, uh, feed quality is very important. And uh, what factors can, uh, you know, like the... Uh, industry consider to to make sure that they are feeding you know high quality pellets to to pigs. So a lot of the factors that a lot of I mean you know your nutritionists, your feed bill managers, your operators all think about is the amount of protein in the diet, and a big one's also the fat content. Um, whether you have any sort of byproducts in there, whether it be DDGs, um, typically you see a reduction in pellet quality due to the oil contents. Um, or you have something that's along the lines of like a wheat mid that's bringing in some gluten that might be improving a little bit of pellet quality. But I guess another way, and I think I'd have to say it, is adding a uh, binder in to try to improve that pellet quality, especially if it's one of those that's borderline, whether it be a high corn diet where, you know, you're not bringing in a whole lot of protein to help with that binding. Yeah. Uh whether it be a, a, a late finisher where, you know, you're starting to pull the, some of that DDGs out too, and you're getting into that high corn, low protein. Yeah, and uh, if uh, let's say you know if if a company uh, decides to to use some of the uh, of the binders, uh, do you know like if the companies are using the same level across all the diets, or they typically focus on a, a specific diets? It you a lot of places will either use it across the board, or they'll have it for specific diets. Um, and so, I mean, with the level of what you use is kind of dependent. Um, we typically recommend up to about a percent to maybe a percent and a half of the diet, depending on how much binding you need. But, you know, you also have to factor in what the, um, uh, I guess, what the return on, on the investment is of that, because you're going to be maxing out that binding capability at some extent to where you're not going to be getting any sort of benefits from over uh, using it. So we, we try to say anywhere between up to that 1%, maybe a percent and a half, depending on the diet type and what, what kind of mill specs you're, you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, like, uh, this is just like, you know, one of the questions that just came to my mind right now. Um, when, when I was with the Smithfield, I remember that we, we were using, you know, um, the, the binder, particularly in the, um, um, in the diets for piglets, just because those diets had more um lactose and more sugar and uh we we had to pellet those diets at a lower condition in temperature mm -hmm. and uh, we were using um in a dry form but i know like um there are some binders that can come in a liquid forms um do, do you know like um what will be the advantage or disadvantages uh disadvantages of uh of each one so for dry you're going to be able to just hand add that in um makes it a little bit, depending on the facility, it can be a little bit easier. You might be able to put that in like a micro system to have that meter in then. Um, or you can actually have somebody go and do it. If you're not using it too often, you can just have that in your uh, hand ad room and you can go in, weigh it up every, you know, six or seven batches or however, however often you use it. Um, and of course, being a binder, it's sticky. So it will cling to things, but that's the benefit of uh, our products is that they're water soluble, so you might get it on your on your jeans or your shirt, but it'll wash right out. 
that that night whenever you take it home. But then when looking at a liquid binder, um, it's you have some of the advantages of if you have the storage capacity and you have the tank space in your feed mill, you can then have it in and then you can pump that straight in. You don't have to have somebody hand adding it to where you might get it, uh, you know, a little bit of spillage or um, you might have a little bit of shrink if, you know, uh, somebody in the warehouse accidentally rips a bag and it falls down and you lose half of it on the floor, things like that. And um, I guess another benefit, depending on how you look at it, depending on the seasons, is whenever you use a, our liquid product or a liquid product in general, you're going to be adding some moisture to that to that uh, mash. To depend, and like I said, depending on where you're sitting at on your moisture contents, that might be advantageous to you because you're going to be bringing in about 50% water with our product or liquid product. So then you're going to be able to get that moisture on and you're going to have a little bit higher inclusion level to get up to the amount you need for, for the dry product. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Especially like when you are working like um, with uh, with corn with a low moisture content, right? And uh, mm -hmm. you are not able to get like to the right um, level of moisture after the conditioner. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense. And um, do I mean since you got like these liquid binders, do you also have like the equipment to um, to pump it and to apply it into the mixer, or or in that case, the companies have to have like the the, the equipment to do it. Or can you use another equipment already in place too? We've seen some people that you, I mean, you could repurpose a fat tank for it um, and use that to meter it in. Now you're probably going to be at a little bit lower inclusion rate than what your fat pumps may, may be uh, in spec for, but you could use something along that lines. But a lot of times we, if you can, we'd, we, we would recommend pumping it into the conditioner because like we said, it is a binder, it is sticky it, and you know, it depends on the feed mill, how often you're getting, climbing into your mixer and, you know, submitting work orders and uh, things like that to where you could put it in the conditioning chamber and pump it in. Then you have a, you have that mixing through from the conditioner picks as it goes along. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, what that. We, that's typically what we recommend. And that's what I like to see. But going into the mixer, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. Um, and, and as you can tell, I don't have like any experience with it with uh, binders. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have seen in some feed mills that they have those systems to um, to apply it into the conditioner, and it probably helps to reduce the buildup in the in the mixer, depending on you know on the on the inclusion level. Mm -hmm. I don't just out of curiosity. Um, when you apply it in liquid form, can you still get to the to the target condition in temperatures? Yes, because um, liquid, you're gonna be going in at a little bit higher inclusion rate, because like I said, you're gonna have, you're gonna be bringing in about a 50% moisture on that. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta get up to the certain amount of dry solids of what you would need for the binder itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you should still be able to get up to that because you're not gonna be pumping in that much extra moisture. That's, you know, it might not be the same ambient temperature, but a lot of times you're going to have some heat trace lines through there or being it, if you're in a fat tank room, it's probably going to be a little bit warmer than ambient. So you shouldn't have any issues achieving your optimum uh, conditioning temperature. Okay. Okay. Um, just on another topic too, uh, when you were doing uh, the research at Kansas, uh, did you also compare, you know, like pellet versus mash just to, because I know like uh, there are still some, uh, some uh, feed mills that I have seen just once that I went to the Midwest that they still feed, you know, mash diets. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you go like to the southeastern part of the U.S., then we feed mainly pellets here. So mm -hmm. I don't know, like if you could share your thoughts on, um, you know, feed form and mash versus pellets. So, yeah, in all, both of my uh, finishing pig studies, uh, we did compare our pelleted treatments to mash. Uh, just so that way we could get that baseline to see what the pellets were doing and I guess uh, compared to the conventional way of feeding uh, pigs with that mash feed. And so I guess looking at it, the improvements that you're getting out of pellets, especially with high ingredient prices that we've seen here in the last, what, three or four years where it's something that we haven't seen in a while, um, you're going to be getting those performance the, the performance enhancements and you're going to be able to make that money back in return. And so getting the improved feed efficiency and in one, in one of my studies, we saw a slight improvement in uh, average daily gain, which 
can be very hit or miss in some pelleting uh, trials. We aren't quite certain on what's causing that, but they can be hit or miss, and it can be due to different environmental conditions and pig pig line or pig genetic lines and things like that potentially. But having that improvement and having that ease of handling, especially going from the truck into the bin and then the bin into the feeder, as long as you're minimizing those fines, it makes uh, managing those feeders much, much easier as well. So you will expect probably like in, 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 in the in future um, years, more of the, you know, industry moving to pelleted diets. I think so. Because I, I, Im I imagine like, you know, ingredients, uh, they are not going to get cheaper. They are just going to get uh, more expensive, right? And especially, you know, if depending on things that happen with it throughout the world, I mean, you might have different tariffs or anything like that to where you, it's going to be harder to get some of these byproducts. Um, and we're also going to be prop may potentially exporting more, uh, you know, corn and soybean meal and DDGs to uh, other countries to where, you know, you're going to have increased competition for some of these. So I, I would, I'd expect that, um, more people are going to be turning to pelleting. Um, there's been a lot of, I guess, interest in the continuing this research. And I mean, we all know that pelleting, it's all said that pelleting is an art form, but whenever you're doing it right, it, it works really, really well. That's true. That's true. And um, what about like, you know, like liquid feeding? Do you know, like if any companies in the U.S. are, are doing a liquid feeding uh, for pigs? And uh, what would be your, your your thoughts on, on that? And because uh, I, I, I have heard I have never seen. But in, in Europe, I know like some some companies are are feeding, you know, liquid diets. Mm -hmm. I personally don't have any experience in it. I've seen a couple articles just briefly that's brushed across my my desk mm -hmm. but i haven't been able to find a whole lot going on in the u.s on it okay okay it's time for our famous three yeah and uh you know like just just to finalize you know like i always um like to I particularly like to get like uh, the advice of uh, our guests to uh, students, you know, mm. and uh, you, you went to uh, Purdue, then you went to Kansas, finished the master, and then uh, now you're working with Beauty Guards. Uh, what would be your advice, you know, for, for students right now uh, beginning, you know, their uh, undergrads or, you know, uh, just beginning their um, um, master degrees, how, how they can, uh, you know, I use the tools that the university provide to be to be um, a successful uh, once that they leave the university. I would say my advice would be get involved in whatever interest groups you can you can join or even think about joining, whether it's in your major within undergrad, whether it's in your graduate student organizations. Um, get involved in something that interests you and something that can help you when times get tough because we all know college graduate school there's going to be a time where it feels like it's it'll break you it it's one of those where it's it's a marathon not a sprint for the most of us mm -hmm. so just find some of those outlets that you can seek and be able to take a step back and know that okay one one c on a paper one c on a test isn't going to define who you are as a student and as a person just take that chance to then build yourself back up and know what you can do from there to improve yourself and improve what you can and improve what's going on around you. It's just kind of taking that and building different stepping stones as you go as a person. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. I think that's 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 a really good advice for, you know, like uh, students. I know like several students um, listen to this podcast and uh, it's a good opportunity for them uh, just to learn about like uh, the different areas of not only like feed science, but also there are other podcasts available for swine, I think, uh, mm -hmm. cattle and, um, and, and poultry. Um, thank you very much for, for meeting with me. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much.